Our Father, you are the one who lives in us. You are the one who teaches us. You are the one who reveals himself to us. You control our minds. You give us wisdom, you give us insight, you give us understanding. We thank you for this wonderful meal and for those hands that prepared it. We give you praise for such wonderful service. And now as we study together, may you be our teacher and our Lord, our God. In Jesus' name, amen. We are comparing and contrasting two educational models, a Hebrew model and a Greek model. The last one that we did was number 10. Am I correct on that? 11. 11. Well, we did 11. And so I apologize for a mistake. Teaches there are absolutes. What are absolutes? Need. Thank you. They're just rock solid truth. What's the opposite of an absolute? Relative. Relative. Correct. It's relative, which means, well, it maybe is true for you, but it's not true for me because in your situation it's true, but in my situation it's not true. Some things are relative, okay? Like eating with chopsticks or eating with a fork and spoon, that's relative, depending on what you want to do. There's no absoluteness. But in the Hebrew model, there are absolutes. Where do these absolutes come from? God. God. And they follow the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are absolutes. They guided American history for some time. And Joel, you're picking this up. I will, I will try to share this with you at another time. Is that all right? Sure. The Greek model teaches that there are no absolutes. All things are according to your feeling, according to your situation, and so what is true for you is maybe not true for everybody, but in this kind of a setting, it leads to the fact that I must respect what you consider to be right and what you consider to be correct, and I should even be celebrating it with you. And it is this model that has led, I believe, to the tremendous division that we have in our culture because there are things that we cannot join in with, we cannot compromise and try, excuse me, and try to come to some agreement with us. Here is number 12. The Hebrew model is based on love for God, love for our neighbor, and love for God's world. It's based on the law. Does that surprise you? Why not? Because, uh, because you've got the law for the Hebrews and they want to focus on that and base it off of it in, your, in their Hebrew schools. Thank you, Kendon, very well. And Benjamin. God is love. Thank you. There is such a, a direction, as Kendon is saying, that, you know, the summary of the law is that you love God above all. Well, if I'm going to train myself, and I'm going to train others to love God above all, then I must be focused on a love for God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And love the creation. See in that creation that this all belongs to God. The creation should not suffer because you and I are ruling over it or using it. It should be blessed, should be cared for what we have. That doesn't mean we may not kill something 
or, or remove something, but our whole process of doing that should be an act of love. If there's going to be death, that death has to happen quickly without suffering. What do you think the Greek model has as its tenet? Mr. Caden. Uh, everything's based on education. All right. I love your answer. Kendon. Everything is based on itself. It's all about me. It's all about myself. All right. Uh, I really appreciate both of your answers. Is there something that is the opposite of love? Hate. You want to say hate, and then you're not comfortable saying that. But when we when when we love someone, we desire to bless them. We desire to encourage them. We we desire to strengthen them. And that's what we do together here, I think, in the class. We build each other up and strengthen each other. The opposite of that would be what we call competition. And the Greek model is based on competition. I must outdo you. I must be smarter than you. I must uh, you know, be more prepared than you are so that I'm going to get the better job and it's so some of you said it's based on self. You are correct on that. But it's not based on love. And so a, a model that's based on love, then I'm going to help my neighbor, I'm going to encourage my neighbor, I'm going to strengthen my neighbor, I'm going to see how is it that I can make your life more Beautiful, more enjoyable, more comfortable. Uh, there's suffering in your life. There's something that is, is destroying you. How can I bless you? The Greek model is based on competition. I'm first, and I will serve myself first. Any comment on that? Joe. Is competition a bad thing? Is competition a bad thing? I think that's an excellent question, Joe. Who would like to respond? Abby. I think it's more selfish and wrong if you're doing it for your own glory. You think it's wrong and selfish if you're doing it for your own glory? Yeah, it's like not God glorifying and you're just doing it to make others think highly of you. So you're doing it for selfish reasons, then it's wrong. Now Joe asked the question, you're answering it well, but we're going to push it a little more. Is it, is competition wrong? Knee. Always let it not to show up. So far, I'm trying to think of example of good competitions in the Bible, and I'm not sure where that comes from. Maybe, no, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of one in the Bible. Anybody want to respond to me? <clears throat> What's the place of competition in our culture? In our economic system, sports, products, mm. sports. There's a lot of competition in sports. Is that wrong? You're shaking your head. No. Now give a reason, Richard. <laughs> well, I agree with Abby. I guess you're doing it just to glorify yourself and think I'm. The best, if I'm the hot one here, then I suppose that's wrong. But to but two two sports teams playing each other, they're competing against each other, right? Yeah, that's not wrong unless you're trying to just glorify yourself. Anybody wanna go deeper? Push rich a little bit? Can 
you name a game where competition is not part of the game? If you do competition out of it, would it be fair to say that golf or bowling, where it's an individual, you're competing maybe against others, but not not as a team. You're you're on your own there. So. I really like this question, Joe, and I really like your answer as well, Henry. How many of you sense that competition in itself is not sinful? When does it become sin? Kendon. It takes place of God when you start going and doing it on Sundays and instead of going to church and worshiping God. I love your idea that church is the excuse for not going anywhere else. I'm serious about that. I think it's also too based on when it moves from glorifying, doing it and glorifying God as to glorifying ourselves. Thank you, Aaron. If it's glorifying God, and so you're using the skills that God has given you and you are uh, sharpening them and training them for the glory of God, unless you're doing it to say, look at me, look at me, look how great I am. I, I like your answer, Aaron. <clears throat> me, I know you've got more to say. Yeah, and I love my God. It should always edify others, not need it. And it always distracts others, it's always edifying. Thank you. No, and their competition really brings out, a, I think it challenges us. We, we do want to be more skillful, we want to be more accurate. Look at the competition among grocery stores, for instance. Nothing wrong with that, right? I think that's what our economy is based on. I'm going to give a better product, better service, at a cheaper price. That's competition. There's nothing wrong with that. Where competition becomes a problem, and I think we are answering that very well, is when it is to glorify myself, not to give glory to God. And I think that is in the art world, it's in the sports world, it's in, I think, all the world. Why are you trying to improve yourself? Why are you trying to become better at things? Is it because you are responsible to God for the talent he's given you and you want to use it well? Or is it because you want the praise for yourself? That's the difference. Anybody want to challenge that or add to it? Does that answer your question, Joe? Yes, I mean, that's what I figured. Competition I always inspired me to do better, like yeah. in school or whatever. Yeah. Competition in itself, I think, is a wonderful blessing, but like all of God's blessings, it can be turned to glorify myself. Thank you, Joe. Number 13, since it is based on love, therefore its yoke is easy, its burden is light. And I say that with rather firmness. This comes from Jesus who says, come to me and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I believe, I'm working here with education, but I'm working too with all of your minds and so on, that this idea that I'm, we're working with encouraging each other to love God, we're encouraging each other to love each other, that's not a heavy burden. 
Its burden is light as it tends to bring peace and joy and love into the classroom and the outside world. Again, I'm speaking from a teacher's perspective. When I was working in Korea with the Christian schools there, uh, they had a, a policy, every classroom must have at least one and up to two handicapped children in it. That was a requirement. So that other children <coughs> would be uh, able to show love and help and encourage each other. And so I, I really like that perspective. And so there is peace, and even students themselves, when you, you teach them their English <coughs> lesson or the Bible lesson, then they would work together, building each other up, helping each other. And so there's, there's, there's peace and joy and love in the classroom. Now when it comes time to testing, then of course they're separated because we're responsible to know you know, how are the students progressing? But the Hebrew model, when you walk into that classroom, you're going to see students helping each other, working together. What do you think the Greek model is going to look like? Its yoke is difficult and its burden is heavy because if I'm working for myself, I'm working to be better than you, smarter than you, then I am not going to help you because helping you, encouraging you, is going to make uh, my <coughs> effort to advance myself, uh, that's going to be decreased. If I can continue to be smarter than you and outdo you, then I'm going to be the one on top. And so, in that philosophy, there's a heavy burden because it brings tension and stress and selfishness into the classroom and the outside world. What's the product that we want? to see in the people that we are working with, that we are training. And if we're promoting selfishness, then that selfishness is going to result in a climate of tension and stress. Does that make sense to you? Everybody's okay? Nobody's upset? All right. Now, is there one more left? Number 14? The Hebrew model is the biblical model that has been rejected by most schools. This is not very appealing. Because the goal of many schools is to be, you know, the best in academic world. The Greek model is the model which most Western schools and some Christian schools embrace. Maybe you sensed that as we were going through these different aspects that the Western world we are greatly influenced by the Greeks and a lot of Christian schools have adopted the Greek model but they have added Bible class they have added prayers they have added chapel and they maybe sing some hymns or something, but the rest 
of their day is a Greek model. Would you say that a Christian education, I'll use those words, that if you had a Christian education, could it still be Christian if you did not have chapel? Could it still be a Christian school if it didn't teach Bible? Yeah. Really, the Hebrew school should the love of God, the love of neighbor, the glorifying God, of standing all and of, of God should be seen in every subject. God is the main character in every subject, every history lesson. It's God's sovereignty, it's God ordained. Every science lesson, same thing. Your literature lesson, your writing lesson. And I'm gonna throw in this one, even Bible. There's a lot of Bible taught where God is not the main character. Just listen to somebody teach David and Goliath. Who, who becomes the main character? And then? David. Yeah, it's very easy to make David the main character. And you boys and girls, you just be brave like David. And God will bless you. No, that's not the issue. The issue is, look how God, living in David, <coughs> strengthens David. And David even says that. I come before you in the name of God, and I'm going to chop your head off. <laughs> that's what he said. Because David is the Christ figure. Goliath is the seed I guess the serpent, the seed of the serpent, if you read the old King James, it really means he has a scale armor. Do you know that? Scale armor, more presented as the, the serpent. Has this been interesting to you? John, a comment? I've got question. a question then, right? So when you look at the Greek model and in, in many schools, right, um, and you, you said based on competition, the yoke is heavy, and, and how do you square that up with a lot of what we hear of um, not being competitive and, well, no one wins, everybody gets a. That's the trend today, isn't right, it? Right, right. And I don't think that's the Greek model. <laughs> uh, today, the, we are numbing down the the whole curriculum in, in the secular schools. I, I hope that's not happening in the Christian schools. But there is a numbing down so that even the, the, the child that struggles a lot is able to be successful. That's a whole different story. But what you're right. saying is correct. But that's not a Greek model school. Thank you, John. All right. Maybe you need to turn the page. A Hebrew lesson on Kangaroo. Did you do the pre-test, post-test? That's fine. No problem whatsoever. But I don't want you to just hear about this. I want to now apply this Hebrew lesson on Kangaroo. And so, this is what I believe is really helpful in our thinking. You're farming, you're doing carpentry work, you are retired and you're just enjoying your gardens, you are your, you know, your busy mothers here. Everything that you're going to be looking at, thinking about, I think these three, four words, probe, 
What does it mean to probe? To look into. Look into. See, I think we as Christians, we do not do a lot of thinking into what we have. And so we're going to probe into kangaroos. What does it mean to ponder? Consider. Consider. Think about. God says that a lot. Consider the ants you slumber. Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. Think about them. And you probe, you ponder, and as you ponder, you're pondering on what God is doing, and it should result in praise from you and me, and then we proclaim what God has done. And so here we go. <coughs> this is for discussion. The first thing everybody has to do is answer this question. How do we make a study of kangaroos Christian? Kendis. We study the creator and he shows us how he created them. How many of you would agree Kendon has a good answer? You better get your hand up because he's very, very good. Anybody want to get, want to enrich that answer? Studying things in creation is like what I think Kepler said, thinking God's thoughts after him. Thinking God's thoughts after him. I really like that, Joel. Is there anything wrong with this question? Benjamin. You can't do it any other way as a Christian. You can't do it any other way. I like that answer because we don't make anything Christian because everything Joel and Kendon just were talking about that everything by its very nature points to God this question starts with the assumption Kangaroos are secular. Kangaroos do not belong to God. Kangaroos are, you know, they developed on their own, and so here we have this problem. How do I make this study of kangaroos Christian? That's the wrong question. We teach the truth about kangaroos. You understand that? It's the secular mind that has taken the kangaroo and separated the kangaroo from God, its creator. And that's what Greek education does to it. We're very much influenced by our Greek educational background. Question two. This is an assignment somewhere in your book. I want everybody to write what is a kangaroo, and you're going to give us an answer. Be patient, Ken. What is a kangaroo? I think you can write it down there and uh, yeah, around, you can write it down at the bottom of page six or page seven. I think there's room. What is 
a kangaroo. And we're going to share those answers. We're not going to say anybody's right or wrong. All right? Who would like to be the first one to tell us what a kangaroo is? Nobody's shocked, right? Creature of God. A creature of God. Henry. It's a very special creature of God. It's the only one that has a pouch, right? It's unique for no other. Henry, I'm, we're going to teach you that there are possums and they're koala bears. Okay. I failed that one. Didn't you? <laughs> That's why you come to this class. All right. Joel, what are you saying? Kangaroo is a marsupial lives in Australia and uses two large eyes feet to get around and is a special part of the creation that is a great kind that would have come from the ark. Thank you, Joel. Joel, what did you write? Just a large marsupial that only lives in Australia. A large marsupial <coughs> that lives in Australia. Anybody want to say? More, me, I'd like to know what the people in the Bronx think of kangaroo. Oh, for me, I just said a two-legged bunny with a pouch and two legs and a creation of God. Thank you. Cole. I said it's an animal that looks like that. I got a picture pointing to You were pointing to your wife. <laughs> Anybody else? Joyce, what did you say? Uh, what did you say, uh, Mr. Feiner? A divinely created mammal. Wow. Amber. Uh, we discussed it together. <laughs> That's great. Dan. Creature of God. All right, all right. Wonderful. Uh, did you write it, Jedediah? Yes, I am. No. <laughs> Marcel, what's a kangaroo? Uh, <laughs> Benjamin, what's a kangaroo? Uh, this a creature of God uh, found in Australia. Wonderful, wonderful. Sam, what's a kangaroo? I just think they look like a water grab. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lowell, did you write it? I've got a picture of a jacket to a dry climate, basically. They live in Australia, which is a little wet season, but the most of it's dry. Thank you. And we're at Joel and Henry. Hey then. Yeah, just uh, basically what everyone else said combined. <laughs> That's a cop out. <laughs> Crystal. A uh, marsupial mammal created by God on day six with big feet, a long tail, and hops. Thank you. And Benjamin? I said animal created on day six. That you did. Did you speak up, Richard? No, I haven't. I normally don't. You know, phrase it this way, but an animal created by God. And the reason I don't phrase it that way is because I guess I just assume everything is, so it's kind of an assumption, but I guess a lot of the world doesn't know that. Thank you, Rich. Adam? Uh, that's a marsupial that gets around by hopping on its hind legs. Thank you. Luke? Thank you. Aaron? 
Uh, kangaroos are large marsupials that are created by God to show his glory through the unique traits that they possess, like their own Thank you. Joe, did you give us your answer? Uh, Burr? Uh, I don't know. It's a big, big marsupial. It has a strong tail for balance. Thank you. John? Very similar, a large um, hopping marsupial with a large tail. Thank you. Josie? Kangaroos and marsupials. And Abby? I said uh, marsupial god created to live in Australia. Marsupial god created to live in Australia. Or it is an animal. It's an animal. <laughs> and Lily? They, they box? Now, I just wanted you to do that because I wanted to hear whether you are influenced by a Greek model or a Hebrew model. What's the difference? Kendon? Oh, it's an animal that can take box and can jump 10 feet. All of you who have God mentioned in your answer are thinking from a Hebrew model. If it's missing and Rich tried to, you know, you apologized for using God's name, didn't you? Well, I just assumed that everybody know that. We would have to mention No, a lot of people but don't even think about it. I, I'm coming to that revelation. They separate so much of creation from God that they, they speak from a Greek perspective. So if your answer has God in it, Creator, you are excellent. Uh, how about this one? You can just raise your hand if you think you know the answer to this and what is the origin of the kangaroo kind. Joe? Creation. Creation. And Burl? Yeah, creation. You okay? Abby? God. 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 Kendon. Created by God on the basis. What's its origin? All of you are are pointed in the right direction, but you're not there. Where does the kangaroo have its origin? What if I asked it this way? Whose idea is a kangaroo? Who thought it up? God. Remember, we, we talked about that earlier in the class, that the origin of all things is God's heart. We compared God creating to you and I creating, and you know, I'm not always comfortable using the word creating, making, but what you create, what you make, what you design comes out of your heart. And we know your heart by by how you make things and how you do things. And so this this dinner tonight was really wonderful. Comes from your heart, Nikki. And Tim, you were responsible for your household, right? <laughs> but you see, that's how we reveal ourselves. You, you, uh, your home, how it's decorated, maybe it's not completely the way you want it, but you're revealing your heart. This is what I love. This is, gives me peace. This gives me joy. Your farm, your, your garden, whatever it is your car, how you keep it clean, whatever. All of that stuff reveals your heart. The origin of the kangaroo kind is the heart of God. Why did he make kangaroos? I'm going to hold you back, Ken, and keep your hand up. You inspire me. Burl, why did he make them? For his glory. <laughs> For his glory. How many of you agree? Is there more to it? For his own pleasure. That's right. Never forget 
God has great pleasure. He rejoices in his work. And so the kangaroo is an animal that he's created to reveal his glory, reveal his pleasure, reveal his... Creativity. Creativity. Do you think God has a sense of humor? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> Does God have a sense of humor? Hmm? How many of you say he certainly does? Why do you think so? Joel? The platypus. <laughs> the platypus. Nee, your hand went up right away. Why do you think God has a sense of humor? Children. No, let me put that's who he is. Like, okay, I love this. Like, when I think about children, when it's snowing, and then I'm like, oh no, it's snowing. And the children and dogs are just me. I say it's nothing. And I just sometimes find it so funny. Just, yeah. You know, there was a Korean man that asked me this question, and he was, he was I called him grandpa, he was older than I am. He was not a Christian for many years, and he took his wife to church every Sunday and sat out in, the, in his car and waited for church to get over. And then it got so cold, he decided he would go into church and sit there because it was warmer. <laughs> and he says, God has a great sense of humor. He's an elder in the church today. But uh, he asked me that question. Does God have a sense of humor? Well, if you watch squirrels and you watch monkeys and you, even your own children, right? God is, has a great sense of humor. But another thing you want to add is that God's displaying his wisdom. He made no mistakes in these things. Wow, I just really find this interesting. How come you're not changing my thing? Here we go. How did God make kangaroos? By his word. <laughs> Say that loud and clear. By his word. By his word. He spoke. What is our relationship to kangaroos? Ben. Made on the same day. All right. Made the same day. Knee. Okay, by God. Thank God, right? Kendon. He stole you. You can have another answer, though, right? Uh, Colt. We're called to be caretakers of all animals that includes kangaroos. I love your answer. You and I are placed over the kangaroo. We are their king. And all the animals on day six presented themselves to Adam. And they submitted to Adam and Adam named every animal. Because he had authority. And so our relationship, we are responsible to God for how we take care of a kangaroo if we have one to take care of. What are we supposed to be doing with kangaroos? Probably the very same answer. Number eight, and this is the last question that I have put in here. Are kangaroos living in their original state that they were living in in the Garden of Eden? So they have changed. <coughs> How have they changed? They fear, they fear man. All right. There's fear of man. Any other change? There's fight off predators. Say that again, please. Have to fight off predators. All right. So they have predators that are going to destroy them. So there is this fighting. Caden. There's competition within the species. Yeah, there's big competition in the species. We'll see that. Thank you. And me? A question about a few of men. Like, can you elaborate more? And like I was saying about lions, sometimes I'm like, even men, even So, like, how, like what, what did she mean by fear of men? 
Okay, say that one more time. My, I've got hearing aids, but I'm not picking them up. Like some animals kill. You know, some animals kill. Yes. Yeah. And I so like when he said, she said kill, man, I wanted to press it out more while she that. Okay, you were. Yeah, when God created the animals in creation, they're, they lived in harmony with each other, and so they didn't fear it. They didn't fear each other. It wasn't until after the flood where God made them food for man. So that relationship changed. Thank you. And before the fall, I don't know when this changed actually. We know it changed after the flood. But all animals were vegetarian. No animal ate meat. And Adam and Eve did not eat because you know, eating meat requires death, requires something to be killed. Does that answer your question, me? I think so, maybe. Okay. I'll take care of it at home. You'll take care of it at home. <laughs> Thank you, Benjamin. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go on here. So the first seven questions of your pretext. Read the first one for us, please, Kendon. Kangaroos are marsupials. Marsupials. Number two, Kelly. Kangaroos are the only marsupials in the world. You're putting true false on the first blank. Number three, Joyce. Kangaroos give Number four. Newborn kangaroos are about the size of the newborn kitten. Amber. Newborn kangaroos are born into their mother's breath. Dan. Newborn kangaroos can hop off the same day they are born. And the final one of number seven. All right. Newborn kangaroos are blind. All right. Now, we're going to read page eight and call. See, this is a real lesson. I developed it in Korea. I'm teaching English with this, and so it's all numbered. It's really nice to work. Cole, would you read the first paragraph? Page eight. Jesus Christ created the first two kingdoms on day six. Keep reading oh, the first sorry. paragraph. You got to go to line seven. Six thousand years ago in the Garden of Eden. But God had thought of them, loved them, and designed them. They were in his heart before he called them into being. They were perfect and complete kangaroos. They were exactly the animals God had in his mind for him and us to show, us to love and enjoy. Thank you. The next paragraph, me. To be kangaroos are nearly born to Australia. They are often seen in the wild, in public parks, gardens, and on, the, on golf courses. And the last paragraph, Jedediah. God designed them to be a part of the family of marsupials. Marsupials are animals with patches for carrying their young. Besides the kangaroos, koalas, wombats, and possums are also marsupials. Okay, here we go. Let me show you some pictures right here. Is that the size of a baby kangaroo? <laughs> Too big? Kangaroos are pretty big animals. How many think that's too big? Okay. Is this their size? What's wrong with it? Too big. Is this correct? That's correct. 
Now, that's about the size of a grape. Now, we're going to ponder this. Probe and ponder. What questions come into your mind when you see this? And this is how God designed the kangaroo. The gestation period of a kangaroo is one month. And this kangaroo leaves the womb, passes through the birth canal, and mom is standing up. <coughs> What question comes into your mind? What do you want to probe? If you were designing kangaroos, is that how you would do it? Ben? How does it eat? How does it eat? That's the kind of question. Consider the kangaroo. What other things do you want to know? What do you want to probe into? How does it stay warm? Because it's in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it born so small, given that the mother is so large? Why so small? The mom is so large. How does it know that it has to get into the pouch? How does it know it has to get into the pouch? Keep going. You are probing. Keep going. How does it get into the pouch? That's right. Because look at its leg. Which of its legs appear to be the most powerful? Its front legs. Its front legs. The hind legs, which are going to be the most powerful, at the time of its birth are useless. The only strength that it has is in its four legs. I like Verl's question. How does it know it has to get into a pouch? What are some other pouch questions that you're going to probe? How does it stay in the pouch? How does it stay in it? Me. What conditions does the pouch need to like so that it, whatever, I don't know what it is. <laughs> the kangaroo can like survive and thrive in it. Yeah. You see, the pouch is about six inches from the birth canal. And mom has a whole lot of fur. How does that little, it's called a joey, by the way, how does it know how to get there? I want to know this. How does it know where the pouch is? Because this little joey is going to die in a matter of a few minutes because it has no covering. It's blind. Can you see that? So the question is, did God make a mistake? No. Why does he make it this way? We'll pick that up next week because it is 7 o'clock. But think about it over this week. Why does God make the kangaroo this way? If he didn't make a mistake. Remember. Why he made kangaroos? To reveal himself. Are you enjoying these classes? Sure, it's fun to teach you. And I, just, I just want you to learn to think <laughs> biblically. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a marvelous God you are. And we chosen by you before the creation of the world to know you and now your creation revealing 
your wisdom, your glory, your power, your holiness, your perfection, your sovereignty. May you bless us as we study together and as we probe and ponder your creation and praise and proclaim your glory. Thanks for a wonderful evening. In Jesus' name, amen.